Okay, so we continue now with Milton. And let's turn to the text of Paradise Lost. We have already been talking about some of the general themes with which Milton is dealing here in the work, but let's look at this in some detail now. And let's begin by looking at the opening lines of the poem. Okay. Everybody moving along to the beginning of the, the text there? Okay, so let's look at the first few lines and see how some of the things I was talking about in our previous segment apply to our understanding of what Milton is up to. He begins, of man's first disobedience. Of man's first disobedience, of course that's going to be Paradise Lost, that's going to be original sin, right? And the fruit of that forbidden tree, you know, the familiar story of the Garden of Eden and the eating of the apple in the Garden of Eden, which constituted the, uh, the original act of original sin, whose mortal taste brought death into the world and all our woe, Okay, so that the consequences of original sin were to bring death, to uh, make it such that uh, we had to labor very hard for our basic sustenance, that women would have to bring forth their children in pain, and so on and so on, okay, as announced by the, uh, the archangel. Okay, brought death into the world and all our woe with loss of Eden till one greater man, and of course this greater man is going to be Christ from a Christian point of view, here capitalized so that we won't miss getting the point. Till one greater man restore us and regain the blissful seat, sing heavenly muse. Sing Heavenly Muse. Now, this is one of those uh, maneuvers that one finds in classical literature with which, of course, Milton was very intimately familiar. And also you find it in much uh, literature running through the 19th century. And that is the invocation of the muse or invocation to the muse. So that in Homer, for example, Homer calls upon the muse at the beginning of the Iliad to sing through him. This becomes a poetic figure for imagination and for inventiveness in poetry. Sing, heavenly muse, that on the secret top of Oreb or of Sinai didst inspire that shepherd who first taught the chosen seed in the beginning how the heavens and earth rose out of chaos. Or if Sion Hill delight thee more and Siloah's brook that flowed fast by the oracle of God, I thence invoke thy aid to my adventurous song that no middle flight intends to soar above the Aeonian mount while it pursues things unattempted yet in prose or rhyme. And chiefly thou, O spirit, that dost prefer before all temples the upright heart and pure, instruct me, for thou knowest, thou from the first wast present, and with mighty wings outspread dove-like saddest brooding on the vast abyss, and madest it pregnant. What in me is dark illumine, what is low raise and support, that to the height of this great argument I may assert eternal providence and justify the ways of God to man. And that's precisely what we were talking about before in our earlier segment. This is his response to the problem of evil. Okay, once again, very, very briefly, because we talked about this at great length before. 
Uh, the problem of evil asserts that we cannot really believe in an all good and all loving and all just God and all powerful God who would have created a world in which there is manifestly both physical and moral evil. And so what Milton has set out to do here is to take the traditional Christian counter argument of man's first disobedience in the fruit of that forbidden tree whose mortal taste brought death into the world and all our woe, etc. And then notice how he concludes that first verse paragraph that he calls upon the Holy Spirit to inspire him that he may assert eternal providence and justify the ways of God to men. Justify the ways of God to men. For those who might still have some questions about the justice of God's justice. Say first, for heaven hides nothing from thy view, nor the deep tract of hell. Say first what cause moved our grandparents, which doesn't mean grandparents in the sense that you and I use grandparents, our grandparents, our great parents, in that happy state favored of heaven so highly to fall off from their creator and transgress his will for one restraint lords of the world besides. Who first seduced them to that foul revolt? And notice the, the question here, who first seduced them? It's not that they would have come up with the idea all on their own, but who first seduced them into that foul revolt? Revolt? Revolt against God and God's orders. The answer here is, notice how he poses rhetorical questions, which then, of course, he's going to provide answers to. The infernal serpent. The infernal serpent. And, of course, the serpent is one of the traditional images by which the devil, or in this case, Lucifer or Satan, is symbolized. The infernal serpent, he it was whose guile, stirred up with envy and revenge, deceived the mother of mankind. What time his pride had cast him from heaven with all his host of rebel angels, by whose aid aspiring to set himself in glory above his peers. He trusted to have equaled the most high. This is Lucifer, right? Who wanted to be the God of God. Okay, and of course his sin was always traditionally referred to as the sin of pride. He trusted to have equaled the Most High if he opposed, and with ambitious aim against the throne and monarchy of God, raised impious war in heaven and battle proud with vain attempt. Him the almighty power hurled headlong, flaming from the ethereal sky with hideous ruin and combustion down to bottomless perdition, there to dwell in adamantine chains and penal fire who durst defy the omnipotent to arms. Nine times the space that measures day and night to mortal men, he with his horrid crew lay vanquished, rolling in the fiery gulf, confounded though immortal. So what are we getting here in the development of what Milton himself calls an argument, right? We don't usually think of poems as arguments, but Milton says he is constructing his poem as an argument. And first and foremost, this argument is the Orthodox Christian response to the posing of the problem of evil. And he says, what possibly could have led our first parents into the kind of foul revolt in which they committed the original sin. 
And he says they must have been seduced. They must have been seduced by somebody else. They certainly wouldn't have done it on their own. And who was that? Ah, it's this infernal serpent. Why would the infernal serpent try to seduce Adam and Eve into committing that horrible original sin with all of its terrible consequences? Ah, because in his pride, he had risen up against God himself and wanted to supplant God in the heavens. And so, as a consequence, God, of course, had him hurled down into the depths of fiery hell. And notice that provides Lucifer with the motive to try to get back at God. Now, this is not fully developed yet, but it's going to be more fully developed later on in the poem, that Lucifer is deeply envious of how God now is favoring human beings, that he has discovered for human beings this paradise, this Garden of Eden. And he wants to make, this is to say, God wants to make the, the woman and the man endlessly happy in this paradise. And of course, this so enrages Lucifer and uh, his diabolical followers that Lucifer then undertakes the journey to planet Earth. And we have this interesting kind of space travel, in which, description of space travel, in which Lucifer goes through space until he gets to planet Earth, and then, of course, to the Garden of Eden, there to do his dirty work of seducing first Eve and then through Eve, Adam, into the fall. OK, so notice that we have set up for us very carefully at the beginning of the poem the basic premise of the work and the basic motivations that are involved. OK, so then we go on and we have a description of hell as utter darkness. Uh, it is, of course, fiery, as you know, had been traditional. It's, it's interesting, by the way, that uh, the kind of punishment that would be meted out in the afterlife can vary according to the geography and climate of the culture that comes up with the idea of a, an afterlife of punishment. For example, uh, the peoples of the Middle East, when they came up with a place of punishment after death, came up with a place of fire, a place in which the, the worst possible torment would consist primarily of it being even hotter than it is in the Middle East. Whereas the peoples of the far north, their conception of hell, hell, by the way, is, is an old Norse word. Uh, their conception of hell is a place which is very, very cold, uh, in which hell is, is uh, situated in a kind of funnel through which the winds from the Arctic Pole blow. And it works on the same principle, by the way, as the freezer compartment in your refrigerator. Uh, and, uh, so, and, and that's because the people of the North have to endure the sufferings of the cold, especially in long and bitter winters. And so to them, a place of punishment after death would be a place even more cold than what they now have to endure. So that's simply an interesting kind of, of, of cultural uh, uh, structuring of the, uh, of the concept of punishment. Did you have a question? Um, yeah. Did John Milton think that, well, because I'm not simple think that hell is in the middle, the center of the earth, right? He doesn't, he's saying that Satan is traveling through space from hell that's somewhere in space or yeah, which is somewhere, yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, because one of the things that I was talking about when I was talking about Milton's cosmology here is that he both uses imagery from the older cosmology and from the newer one. 
And uh, yes, in terms of the older one, hell was in the dead center of the earth. Look at Dante. That's exactly where Dante locates hell, and especially the lowest part of hell is in the center of the universe. Because that was, in the old Ptolemaic cosmology, the farthest point away from God. Now, in Milton, and your question is a very good one, in Milton, we have a different kind of cosmology. We have hell being situated somewhere else. It is below heaven, whatever that means, whatever above and below mean in this cosmology, uh, but it is not within the center of the earth. Okay, uh, and we can look at this further as we go along. Follow me to line 105. This is, this is Satan or Lucifer now speaking. Okay. Um, okay, well, yeah, well, actually, this is not Satan speaking. This is Beelzebub speaking. Uh, he says, What though the field be lost? All is not lost. The unconquerable will and study of revenge, immortal hate, and courage never to submit or yield, and what is else not to be overcome? That glory never shall his wrath or might extort from me, to bow and sue for grace with suppliant knee and deify his power, who from the terror of this arm so late doubted his empire and were low indeed that were an ignominy and shame beneath this downfall. Well, okay, so spoke the, uh, or spake the apostate angel, though in pain, vaunting aloud, but racked with deep despair. Okay, so um, we move along and we see Satan now, and this is in lines uh, 193 and following. Satan talking to his nearest mate, this is, you know, obviously his fellow devil here. With head uplift above the wave, remember there are waves of fire, by, by the way, it's a kind of lake of fire apparently. Uh, with head uplift above the wave and eyes that sparkling blazed, his other parts besides prone on the flood, extended long and large, lay floating many a rood in bulk as huge as whom the fables name of monstrous size, Titanian or earthborn that ward that, that, yes, that ward on Jove, and so on and so on. Notice the references, of course, to classical mythology, because after all, this is one of the great works of the Renaissance and the revival of interest in the classics, classical learning, classical mythology and poetry. And then skip down just a little bit to 209 and following. We have a famous description of the awesome heroic demean demeanor of Satan. So stretched out huge in length, the arch fiend lay, chained on the burning lake. Nor ever thence had risen or heaved his head, but that the will and high permission of all ruling heaven left him at large to his own dark designs. So he would have been totally powerless except that God allowed him a limited capacity to move, to think, to act. That with reiterated crimes he might heap on himself damnation while he sought evil to others. 
and enraged might see how all his malice served but to bring forth infinite goodness, grace, and mercy shown on man by him seduced, but on himself treble confusion, wrath, and vengeance poured. Okay, so that even through the sin, this is going to be a theme that will come up later on in Paradise Lost, that even though it was awful that human beings fell through original sin. The good side of that was that it brought forth Christ and the redemption. So that that's the, the positive side of the Christian narrative. And it's only alluded to here, but it's developed much more fully later on. Forthwith, Upright he rears from off the pool his mighty stature. On each hand the flames driven backward slope their pointing spires and rolled in billows leave the midst a horrid veil. Then with expanded wings he steers his flight aloft incumbent on the dusky air that felt unusual weight till on dry land he lights as if it were land that ever burned with solid as the lake with liquid fire. Well, okay, and then his next mate follows him along. And then in 242 and following. Is this the region, this the soil, the climb, said then the lost archangel? This the seat that we must change for heaven? This mournful gloom for that celestial light? If, if, if that's going to be so, be it so, since he who now is sovereign can dispose and bid what shall be right. Farthest from him is best, whom reason hath equaled, force hath made supreme above his equals. Farewell, happy fields, where joy forever dwells. Hail, horrors, hail, infernal world. And thou, profoundest hell, receive thy new possessor, one who brings a mind not to be changed by place or time. The mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell, a hell of heaven. And that's a very famous quotation and very famous, uh, well, very famous pair of lines, you know, that have been very, very frequently quoted over the centuries. Um, so the mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell, a hell of of heaven. In one sense, Satan is his own hell, as we sometimes say. What matter where, if I be still the same, and what I should be, all but less than he whom thunder hath made greater, here at least we shall be free. We may be damned, but here at least we shall be free. The Almighty hath not built here for his envy will not drive us hence. In other words, will not drive us from this place. Here we may reign secure and in my choice to reign is worth ambition though in hell. And then we have one of the most famous lines in English literature. Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. Well, okay. Um, see what's happening here? We're having a description of Satan being not repentant, not downcast, not depressed, not despairing, but standing up proudly and defiantly and saying, if this is the way it's going to be, then this is the way it's going to be. Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. And of course this is a further acting out of what conventionally would be regarded as his sin of pride. His sin of pride. Putting himself above 
all and everyone else. Well, notice also the heroic description of Satan. This raises a very, very, very interesting and important point. A little bit later on, William Blake, a uh, very famous uh, English poet of the tail end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century. We don't take him up in this course, but he comes up at the beginning of the, of the follow-up course, uh, the British Literature II survey. Blake at one point said, the real hero of Paradise Lost is Satan. Now that poses a very interesting kind of problem. And that concept is picked up by Byron, another great romantic poet, who echoes the Blake judgment and likewise says that Satan is the true hero of Paradise Lost. Now notice what the problem is for Milton. On the one hand, he, as an Orthodox Christian, is going to have to condemn Satan and everything about Satan and everything that Satan has done not only in his rebelling against God, which got him and his comrades cast out of heaven and down into hell, but also in his seducing Eve and through Eve, Adam, and bringing about the original sin on earth. So, Satan should be the bad guy, right? And yet at the same time, he has to make Satan a worthy antagonist. And so he gives him a kind of heroic stature, especially in the early books of Paradise Lost. And he becomes so heroic that he becomes almost admirable in his, in his proud defiance of uh, you know, anyone, in this case obviously God, but uh, God and the, the other archangels who remained loyal to God in his proud defiance and his assertion of his own independence and self-will, that becomes a problem for Milton. Okay, because later on we're going to see a description of Christ. And in the description of Christ, even though it is perfectly orthodox in its presentation, it just isn't as moving or as exciting or as appealing as the description of Satan. And that's one of the reasons why Blake and then Byron said Satan is the true hero of Paradise Lost. Now think of it also in terms of something else I said a moment ago. You have to give a heroic figure who's going to perform heroic actions a worthy antagonist. Otherwise, the person's actions are not really seen to be heroic, right? I mean, if you're going to have an Achilles emerge as the great hero of the Trojan War, you have to give him an opponent who is worthy of him, right? And Hector, of course, is the one warrior among the Trojans who is not exactly the equal of Achilles, but he certainly is a worthy opponent for Achilles. He's a very, very great heroic figure himself. Now, if you're going to have an antagonist of God, likewise, do you have to have an antagonist who is worthy of God? Well, that means that you have to give very exaggerated heroic qualities to the very evil of this evil figure. And in doing so, you run the risk of making him look very appealing. Now, uh, think about this in more commonplace ways. When you go to a movie, uh, often isn't it the bad guy you remember? Not necessarily the good guy, but often it's the bad guy, it's the villain that you remember, and uh, who, who makes the most vivid impression on one's mind and imagination. At any rate, that's frequently true. So that's not simply a theological problem, but it's an aesthetic problem for, for Milton to try to solve. Now, one of the ways he deals with this is later on, he has 
Satan decline in stature and eventually Satan and the other devils are simply slithering around like horrid uh, snakes, horrid vipers. Uh, well, that's a far cry from the heroic stature with which he is described here at the beginning of the poem. Okay, so we see, for example, this is in um, 283. It scarce ceased. This is Beelzebub. Uh, had scarcely spoken. When the superior, that is to say Satan, the superior fiend, was moving toward the shore, his ponderous shield, ethereal temper, massy, large, and round, behind him cast, the broad circumference hung on his shoulders like the moon, whose orb through optic glass, the Tuscan artist views at evening. Well, okay. And as the footnote points out, this is, uh, the Tuscan artist would be Galileo. Okay. So, he's an enormous figure. And he has great rhetorical power. So that moving a little bit further along, he is going to speak to his fallen troops to rally them, to cheer them up and to rally them, and to say, this is really not so bad after all, because at least here we are free, and at least here we can defy even the Almighty. And uh, so in 356 and following, forthwith, from every squadron and each band, the heads and leaders, Thither haste where stood their great commander. Godlike shapes and forms. Godlike shapes and forms. See the stature of these figures? Excelling human, princely dignities and powers that erst in heaven sat on thrones. And so forth. And then we have the uh, the of course, we have uh, Satan speaking to them. And this is also going to uh, lead in the second book to the, the debate about whether or not it is going to be too dangerous to risk another war on heaven, to attempt an invasion on heaven itself. And there's going to be, by the way, a discussion in a kind of parliament of devils in which they're going to debate. The different devils are going to get up and they're going to speak their minds in the argument about how best to proceed next. And uh, so finally, of course, what Satan is going to decide is that he is going to undertake the, uh, the, the, the great mission of undermining God's will for human beings by seducing humans into the fall in the Garden of Eden. In the meantime, of course, we have moved to heaven and we have God the Son in the Trinitarian conception, Orthodox Trinitarian conception, uh, Christian Trinitarian conception. And uh, we have God the Son, and uh, of course God the Son is ultimately going to be the redeemer of human beings after their fall. Uh, in book three, we are going to have not only the council in heaven, which parallels the council in hell, but we're going to have the conclusion of Satan's journey. And uh, Satan now, as we were talking about a few minutes ago, has been traveling through space. And what is he doing? He is coming into the Garden of Eden, where we find uh, Adam and Eve in their bower. Bower is an older word for a kind of
dwelling place or room. And frequently in earlier poetry, there had been images of a bower of bliss, such as in Edmund Spencer in his Fairy Queen, uh, which would be a bower, a, a kind of residence here in nature, not in a house, but in nature. Because why would you need a house? You see, you're in paradise. Uh, we have houses in large part because uh, we have to defend ourselves against the elements, right? Uh, heat, cold, storms, and the like, or, or intruders, or dangerous animals, or something like that. And so we have to construct dwellings for ourselves to, uh, to secure ourselves in. But if one lived in the Garden of Eden, there would be no need to have some kind of a dwelling like that. So these are people simply living in nature. And of course, one of the things that's going to come up, uh, obviously later on, and, and I'm sure everybody in this room knows what I'm alluding to, is that they, they're not wearing any clothes. Well, why would they wear clothes? I mean, there's, 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 um, what are clothes for? I mean, clothes are, are partly in our culture for modesty, but they're also protective, right? I mean, they're sort of the practical function of being protective. Well, you're in the Garden of Eden, uh, and there's, there's no need for the kinds of cultural defenses that we have, because we live, from Milton's point of view, in a fallen state. And of course, the very nakedness of Adam and Eve is itself going to be what they are going to try to cover after they have committed their sin. And then the, the natural nakedness of their bodies is going to become a sign of shame. And so God, when he will come into the, into the garden a little bit later on, is going to say, well, wait a minute, why are you guys trying to cover yourselves? Uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, that is because they now are symbolizing their sense of guilt and their sense of shame through their nakedness. Now, one of the things, of course, that people have often theorized in more recent times is that that becomes one of the shaping influences on our attitudes towards the human body. Our attitudes towards the human body. And we have very ambivalent attitudes towards the human body. On the one hand, we think that the human body is good and certainly is beautiful. But on the other hand, uh, there are certain oddly uh, shamed feelings associated culturally and perhaps individually as well with the human body and the exposure of the human body. So um, that too is going to become a, an important symbolic uh, uh, dimension in this work. Okay, so let's look at the description of Adam and Eve, and I'm in book four now. Two eighty-eight and following. Book four, lines two eighty-eight and following. Okay. Two of far nobler shape. This is, I mean, there are lots of things going on in the Garden of Eden, right? All the lovely vegetation and, uh, and of course, the animals and so forth. But here we have in book four, 288 and following, two, that is to say, two beings of far nobler shape than the others, erect and tall, Godlike erect, Godlike erect. See, God walks on two feet in a kind of anthropomorphism, right? You know what anthropomorphism is? Let me go to the tablet. <laughs> 
See, I'm getting you ready for your graduate record exams and your law school admission tests and so forth uh, by enhancing and enriching your vocabulary. Uh, <laughs> anthropomorphism, anybody know what that means? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, no, go ahead. <laughs> It's giving uh, human characteristics to a concept like you make death into the Grim Reaper and stuff like that. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, anthropos is a word for, for sometimes translated as man, but it's really human. I mean, it's not man in the sense of only male. Uh, it's, it's human in the sense of male and female uh, together. Uh, anthropos is, is human. And then morphe is the Greek word for form. So some thing which is presented in the form of a human being which is not itself a human being. And your example is a very good one. Uh, the image of death, say, is the Grim Reaper, where we have the human figure of the, the Grim Reaper. Well, so also, with God. This has been one of the great debates throughout the history of religions, and it's not exclusive to Christianity. It's also been a debate in Judaism. It's a debate in other great world religions. What do we do when we give ourselves images of the divine, but those images take human form? Have we in some way scaled God down, or the divine down, or the gods down to human form? Which would be, most religious believers would say, a real sacrilege. On the other hand, how can you have some sort of conception of God without having some kind of image of that God? Okay, I mean, it's a real problem. I mean, there are various ways of trying to deal with that, but it's a real problem. In the early church, for example, it was a real problem, uh, as some of you know, if you've studied either church history or you've studied art history, uh, a movement called iconoclasm, in which there were those, the iconoclasts, who were uh, going and saying you couldn't have any kind of image of God in the churches. Okay, uh, in paintings or in sculpture or anything or other like that. Well, eventually the church decided to allow images of the divinity to be presented in the churches so long as it was clearly understood that those images really were not God. I mean, that's not what God looked like, you know, or acted like and so forth. But it's, it's an ongoing kind of issue. And so here we have uh, human beings being regarded as noble because they are godlike in standing erect on two feet. Well, that's a touch of anthropomorphism, isn't it? OK. So they are erect and tall, godlike erect, with native honor clad. They're clad with their own native honor. In naked majesty seemed lords of all, and worthy seemed, for in their looks divine the image of their glorious maker shone. Truth, wisdom, sanctitude, severe and pure, severe, but in true filial freedom placed, whence true authority in men, though both not equal, as their sex not equal seemed. Aha, aha, noble as they are, noble as they are, they're not quite equal, okay? Um, not equal as their sex not equal seemed. For contemplation he and valor formed, for softness she and sweet attractive grace. 
okay? I mean, see how we're beginning to differentiate between male and female? According not to physical characteristics, but according to cultural designations and culturally defined characteristics. What's the man? Well, the man is the thoughtful one. The thoughtful one, right? I mean, you wonder where do these things come from? Okay, you ever get into a discussion about uh, gender stereotypes, about men and women and so forth? Well, what if somebody were to ask you, well, where do those things come from? What's, what's the evidence for that? Well, you can go back to sources like this and you can find them. I mean, Paradise Lost was a cultural document of very, very, very great value and significance and importance throughout the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, uh, at the very least, and, and certainly continues in some ways to be so in our own time. Um, people who have studied reading habits in the 18th century, that is to say the century that immediately followed the publication of Paradise Lost, have said that in the typical household, if they had any books at all, and most people were beginning to uh, try to become literate at any rate, if they had the, the, the means to get some kind of tutoring. If they had any books at all, they had the Bible. Of course, you wouldn't be surprised by that. Paradise Lost and Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, which is also a, a religious allegory of this period. But Paradise Lost was in virtually every household that had any kind of books at all. That's the kind of, of admiration and cultural value that was placed on this work. Okay, so, go back to my point. Look at the way gender is defined. Now, we're not going to be able to get this all in in the next uh, minute and 47 seconds, but we'll come back to it in the next seg segment as well. Okay, so for contemplation, he and valor formed. Contemplation, thinking, understanding, analyzing problems, coming up with solutions, and valor. Valor, bravery, doing deeds of daring do. For softness she and sweet, attractive grace. Okay, so she's the soft one. He's the, the one who not only thinks but can be really tough. Uh, she is soft, apparently, mentally as well as physically, uh, but she has a sweet, attractive grace. He for God only, she for God in him. Okay, he is made to follow God only, but she is made to follow God in him, the God in him. Okay, what does that mean? Well, that God has planted in the male of the species God-like qualities that are not given to the female of the species. And so, while the man worships God, the woman worships God through worshiping her man. Sound familiar? <laughs> okay. <laughs>